Okay, we're going to call this meeting to an order. We do not yet have a quorum, but we're going to go ahead and move forward with the bills. We have a lot on the schedule today, so I appreciate everyone being here this morning, and um, hopefully we can move through these uh, with good conversation, but also on time. Uh, to begin, I would like to welcome, today is the Minnesota Nursery and Landscape Day at the Capitol, and I understand we have a large contingency up there. I'm not sure if we have any over there, but welcome. We appreciate all that you do, and we appreciate you being here this morning. So our first bill up this morning is going to be House File 1257. Uh, Chair Anderson, I'd like to hear your bill at this time. And this bill will be held over for possible inclusion in the omnibus bill. So uh, Chair Anderson, to your bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. House file 1257 would uh, provide some funding to help uh, build out and expand our infrastructure to uh, promote and uh, expand the use of uh, ethanol E15 in Minnesota. And we are just talking earlier that uh, a vision was had years and years ago before I got here even about uh, expanding some of these, these products for the good of Minnesota and farmers who produce the corn to make ethanol. And we've really come a long ways. And um, E10, E85, and now E15 are products that are products of choice for our consumers. And, and what this bill does, Mr. Chair, is, is to uh, incentivize, to expand the infrastructure to make uh, E15 more available to the consumers' uh, gas buying public here in Minnesota. And with me, Mr. Mr. Chair, a couple of folks to testify and just talk about the E15 and the, what it can do and what it has done so far in Minnesota. Okay. <coughs> Chair Anderson, just hold on one second with that. We do have a quorum now, so we would like to call this meeting to order. And uh, Representative Keel, have you uh, read the minutes and are, do they meet your uh, approval? Yes, Mr. Chair. I will move the minutes from uh, uh, March 2nd. Thank you very much. Representative Keel moves that the March 2nd minutes be approved. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion, motion passed. Okay. Sorry about that interruption, Chair Anderson. Back to your bill. We have some testifiers. I'd like uh, to Mr. let them speak Mr. now. Mr. Chair, hold on one second. Okay. I guess I do need to have you move your bill okay. for possible inclusion. I'd like to move House File 1257 for to be laid over possible inclusion in the uh, Ag Finance Bill. Thank you. Hopefully no more interruptions by me. Thank you. Please proceed. <laughs> I've lost my train of thought. I'll bring it back with E15. Get going. I have a couple of folks to testify to talk about uh, kind of where we've been, where we, where we hope to go in uh, promoting this product here in Minnesota. Uh, thank you for being here. Please uh, uh, state your name and who you are with today, and yes, then proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, committee. My name is Randall Doyle. I'm CEO of Alcorn Clean Fuel at Claremont, Minnesota. Uh, as CEO of Alcorn, I'm uh, representing one of the earliest plants built in the state uh, as a result of, of the far-thinking legislation that the state of Minnesota passed. Uh, I'm also uh, chairman of the board of Guardian Energy LLC in Janesville, Minnesota. And that means I'm also representing uh, the newest plant state, so uh, represent both the oldest and the newest, uh, kind of run the gamut there. Uh, when I came to Minnesota in 1995, it was a direct result of Minnesota's vision to change the rural landscape and the urban landscape at the same time. Minnesota had an issue with air quality. Uh, the Twin Cities was out of compliance, uh, and there was a struggle to figure out how to, how to fix that. One of the ways was to require an oxygenate uh, to be blended with fuel. There were two oxygenates uh, at that time, ethanol and methyl tertiary butyl ether, MTBE. Minnesota thought, well, we could produce ethanol because we grow corn. We have a rural economy that's in not very good shape. And uh, they saw the development of, an, of a new industry as a boon for the uh, rural economy for small towns, for the tax base, uh, for job creation, and a way to generate uh, a clean burning fuel that could help uh, clear up the air in the state of Minnesota. Uh, that was what the legislation looked for. But it was farther reaching than that. Over the years, the, the legislatures also said, 
we want to have more and more of this uh, in our fuel supply, more and more ethanol, uh, more and more clean burning fuel. And to get the, to those goals, uh, we have first uh, blended nearly all the gasoline in the state uh, with E10, 10% ethanol. We've also had E85 out there, but unfortunately with the changes in uh, the CAFE standards, uh, E85 vehicles, flex fuel vehicles, no longer get the credits that they used to, and so auto manufacturers are not manufacturing those. That means that for the state of Minnesota to be able to hit its targets uh, for replacement of, of uh, petroleum and uh, having clean burning fuel, we're going to have to do other things. And one of those things that we're, do, we're trying to do is to help build out the infrastructure for E15. 15% ethanol is, is uh, able to be used in all cars manufactured after 2001. Most uh, of the new cars being manufactured today uh, have that covered in their warranty. Uh, you, as you understand, it takes a little while for manufacturers to catch up with uh, what EPA has, uh, has stated is possible. But that's the purpose of this, is to help uh, those, those folks who are, are running stations, particularly uh, in our vision, the folks that are perhaps less well-funded, smaller uh, station owners, help them with a, a little bit of the infrastructure so that they can actually get out there and start selling E15 and making that available to more and more of our consumers. Thank you, Mr. Doyle. Members, uh, any questions that we do have for the testifiers or to the person carrying the bill will hold till the end. Um, so uh, moving on from that, we have another testifier Thank here. Good morning, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. My name is Tim Rudnicki. I am the executive director of the Minnesota Biofuels Association based in Minneapolis. And we're here to speak in support of Representative Anderson's bill, House File 1257. And quite briefly, uh, we support this bill because it does uh, several positive things. Again, as Mr. Doyle pointed out, there's a long history of Minnesota working to try and develop the biofuel industry in Minnesota. And uh, Minnesota has become very successful at producing ethanol. Uh, the one thing we need to do is connect the dots here, and that's between production and the consumer. And I'm here to also report to you that um, a pilot project uh, which was uh, being wrapped up uh, from 2016 has been very successful in helping some retailers do the very thing that Representative Anderson's bill is attempting to do, and that is to provide some degree of uh, technological support and technology so retailers can make the transition to offer E15. It could be as simple as a few hundred dollars to uh, recalibrate a dispenser, and it could be uh, several thousand dollars to actually replace dispensers. The good news is from the pilot project, we've seen that when retailers have the option to offer E15 to consumers, they're actually finding consumer interest. In fact, uh, several stations uh, in their first day of operation were selling upwards of 3,000 gallons of E15. If you do the math on that, that's almost a million gallons a year. There's another good benefit. E15 is generally 10 cents a, a less per gallon. So what this bill does is, is it will build upon the success of a very successful pilot project. And that will allow more retailers to offer E15. Uh, the potential savings per household if for one driver ranges from about 48 to $60 a year. That's just the start. And there's also greenhouse gas emission reduction benefits. And uh, I'm more than happy to answer any questions, but I'd like to draw your attention to two pieces of uh, information that were in your information packs. One is a, a kind of a color brochure <coughs> which answers a lot of questions about um, the environmental benefits of biofuels as they're produced in Minnesota. It also has an economic uh, analysis of the benefits of biofuels, not only from production but to the consumer. And there are endnotes which will take you to government agencies that have validated this information. And uh, uh, I guess finally, there's one other piece of information. It's a one-page case statement that goes into some of the metrics behind the benefits of this bill. So once again, uh, we urge you to support House File 1257. We think it has incredible economic benefits, their energy security benefits, their consumer benefits, and their environmental benefits. And uh, I thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. Thank you, Mr. Rodnicki. And we have another testifier. Please state your name and who you represent. Mr. Chairman, my name is Kevin Toma, and I work for the members of the Minnesota Petroleum Marketers Association. I, 
I want to uh, uh, touch on what uh, one point that the previous testifiers um, testified to that the stakeholders in this group are the folks that I represent and we are asking that we be a part of that stakeholder group. The stakeholder group isn't defined in the bill, so we would like to make sure that we're a part of that uh, stakeholder group. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Toma. Um, do we have any questions for the testifiers at this time? Is there anyone in the audience who would like to testify for or against House File 1257? Okay. Uh, Chair Anderson, would you like to have any final comments? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Again, Minnesota has some uh, replacement uh, petroleum goals in Section uh, 239.79, uh, and we need to ramp up to 25% by the year 2020 and 30% uh, by the year 2025. So this would be a good way to, to kind of jumpstart that and to keep it moving in the direction of more uh, biofuels in, in our state's gas supply. So with that, Mr. Chair and members, thank you for hearing the bill, and I would uh, encourage your support. Thank you, Chair Anderson. And House File 1257 is laid over pos for possible inclusion in the Omnibus Agricultural Finance Bill. Thank you. The next bill on the agenda is House File 2032. Representative Pierce, oh, he's already up there. Morning, Mr. Chair. Good morning, Representative. Would you like to move your bill? I would uh, like to uh, move my bill, make sure I get them in the right order, 2031 32. Uh, for possible inclusion. I believe we, does it matter? We had 32 first, but I don't care oh. which one we move forward. Either one is fine. It's up to you. I, I brought our friend the Emerald Ash Borer this morning. Uh, pass that around and, and just get to be a clear, which house file are you moving? 2031. 2031. Yeah. Uh, Representative Pearson, please present your bill. Sure, very good. Uh, good morning, Chair members, and, and uh, uh, we're all familiar with the Emerald Ash Bore, uh, having been on this committee, uh, even the short amount of time that uh, new members have been on the committee. It's uh, something that's had a huge impact on the state of Minnesota, and uh, um, there are some updated maps that, that I'm actually handing out as well that, that will show some of the quarantine counties that are now uh, immediately affected. And this is not, not a new experience for the state of Minnesota. We've had invasive species in the past and we have a little bit of a precedent that's been set up. I, uh, in my youth, I remember the Dutch elm disease of the, of the 70s and how that impacted some of the communities in, in southern Minnesota. I, I remember that visibly driving through the communities as, as a you know elementary school kid and and being almost disturbed watching the trees being cut down uh, street by street and and uh, it, it's something that we've seen in the recent uh, recent past as well in 2010 we had uh, some situations where um, again because of quarantines and whatnot we uh, uh, have have a lot of work that's being done we'll build uh, 20 house file 2031. Um, really works towards uh, helping some of our communities, the, the cities and, and whatnot throughout the state of Minnesota um, through the bonding process, uh, funding some of the, some of the um, work that needs to be done to, to replace and, and remove some of these trees. So uh, with that, I, I have um, Ms. Zhu. Zuma. She wanted me to call her the crazy tree, tree lady, but I, I, I refused, but, but I think she was afraid I'd say her name wrong. So Ms. Zumach is here to give us testimony on, on the impacts that, that this bill would have. Thank you, Ms. Zumach. Please state your name and who you represent for the record. And thank and you, Mr. Sir. Chair and committee members. My name is Karen Zumach, and I am the Director of Community Forestry for Tree Trust, which is a nonprofit here in the based in the Twin Cities. I also am the current vice president of the Minnesota Shade Tree Advisory Committee, also known as MinSTEC. Uh, we are the state's urban forest council. Our role is to inform you decision makers about the pressing issues in regards to our urban and community forests. So here I am doing so today. Uh, thank you, Representative Pearson, for your leadership in this issue. And of course, to Representative Hansen for your past leadership in this issue. This is not our first time here. Um, and as we've, as we've talked about uh, briefly, this is, EAB is the most destructive forest pest to ever hit the United States. It has killed hundreds of millions of trees in states to the east of here, spreading to 30 states in just 15 years. 
It was first discovered in Detroit and since then has killed hundreds of millions and caused hundreds of millions of dollars in damage. All of this in a ridiculously short period of time. For the past three legislative sessions, we here at MinStac, many of us here today, uh, as well as the League of Minnesota Cities, Minnesota Forestry Association, Minnesota Nursery and Landscape Association, over there, uh, and the Society of American Foresters have been working diligently to advocate for funding for communities to manage this invasive pest. Research has shown that a comprehensive strategy formula formulated around a centralized source of funding can help manage this pest in a way that is far less expensive, far less expensive than previous strategies of just removing and replacement, which is what uh, states to the east of here were forced to do to manage this pest uh, when it first arrived here. Uh, these previous strategies cost the most and they preserve the least amount of environmental benefits. Uh, so this comprehensive strategy that we're pushing for is one that includes all the tools in the toolbox, a research-based approach that includes inventory, making sure that communities know what they have, knowing, uh, knowing and understanding what they're up against in regards to EAB, using removal and replanting as, of course, a strategy, but also recognizing that there are high-value ash trees that are worth preserving. Um, this is shown to be the most effective way to slow the spread, and to be honest, at this point, that's all we can really hope for in regards to EAB in the state of Minnesota. Research has made amazing advances over the past decade, and if we can slow the spread in areas of the state where it's already got a foothold, we can actually help prepare communities where it isn't quite established yet. Um, finding a way to let that science catch up with the pest. Um, if we can do that and make some space, put some daylight between those areas that are potent significantly infested, uh, we can maybe change the fate of our black ash swamps in northern Minnesota because in the end that's really what we're trying to protect. Um, what we know is that EAB is a predictable disaster. There is nothing to say that Minnesota will be any different than any other state um, and what we need is, is for action to move forward. So there were many of you uh, back in 2010 as Representative Pearson alluded to, your predecessors and many of you here recognize that EAB was going to be a big deal in 2009 when it was first found. Um, and within a short period of time, EAB grants were made to communities to help them prepare for EAB. And these grants were arguably instrumental in keeping that spread slowed to a place where we could, we could you know, make some space between full-on infestation like we see in states to the east of here. But unfortunately, um, that's where the investment in EAB management uh, started and ended um, on behalf of helping communities. It's been eight years since EAB was discovered. It has spread to 15 counties here in Minnesota, and trees are dying every day. Uh, this is a predictable disaster. This is a storm uh, that we can see coming. There are nearly three million ash trees in our cities and towns across the state of Minnesota, and this is not a one central region of the state. This is an entire statewide issue. And these trees are providing significant environmental benefits to the communities in which they grow. So for you to understand the magnitude of this issue, we need you to all think about trees as something more than just their leaves and trunks. Uh, they're a piece of infrastructure in our communities and they're providing valuable benefits, uh, just like the gray infrastructure of our streets and sewers and storm systems. Uh, so for you to, to really get the magnitude of what that looks like, a mature ash tree, 18 inches, which is about the average uh, age here in Minnesota of our ash trees, will provide about $165 worth of benefits just standing there on the side of the street. Um, and those benefits include the mitigation of upwards of 2,000 gallons of stormwater every year. So this is a huge impact when you think about water quality, when you think about uh, what, those, what that translation of the millions of gallons of water will happen um, as things uh, die through, across our state. These trees also increase, increase property values. They can mitigate uh, the urban heat island effect, of course, putting, lowering energy costs. And on top of all of that, trees improve the health of our communities. Uh, they clean the air we breathe, both indoor and outdoor air. They create a sense of community just standing there. EAB threatens all of these benefits. House File 2031 provides a great first start in helping communities manage this pest, but we are running out of time if we stand any chance to manage this pest differently than it has in other states. As more and more time passes, our management options decrease. The only thing left on the table is that most expensive removal and replacement option, which results in environmental destruction, um, 
and as environment and as ash trees die, they become hazardous and brittle. Those winds that we've experienced over the past couple of days, those 50 mile an hour winds is all it takes to knock down a standing dead ash tree. As the trees die, these, the, the costs and pressures on municipal budgets will continue to increase at an exponential rate. These costs will then be having to get translated onto the homeowners who are seeing their own property values decrease because their, trees are, their streets are devoid of trees. Uh, a recent study in Milwaukee looking at the effects of invasive species on canopy cover showed that it takes an entire generation, 30 years, to restore the canopy levels to those levels pre-invasion. If you're looking at just using that antiquated management strategy of removal and replacement only. Hundreds of millions of trees have died. We stand to lose one billion ash trees in the state of Minnesota. This is a emergency. Um, research has advanced and the management options are available here. What we need is leadership to make the science accessible to all communities. The small communities, the big communities, the ones with the 25 inch ash trees across their cities because that's what they planted after Dutch elm disease. Um, what we're looking to have is an orderly transition away from this over reliance on ash species. Many uh, communities looking at anywhere from 20 to 40 percent. Uh, we believe that House File 2031 uh, can do just that if you make it a reality. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Zumach. Uh, are there any other are there any other people in the audience who wish to testify for or against House File 2031? Please come down. And thank you for joining us today. Uh, please state your name and who you represent and, and go ahead with your testimony. Kate Wally, City of Fridley. Uh, Fridley is an inner ring suburb in the north on the uh, east bank of the Mississippi River and we have approximately 30% of our urban canopy is green ash. Um, in much the fashion that Ms. Zumak uh, talked about, uh, we have done an inventory, we have crunched the numbers, and we're facing a bill of $600,000 as the best and most cost efficient uh, method of treating the ash and cutting down those in poor condition um, over the next several years. Preserving approximately 45% of our urban canopy by injection and then uh, proceeding with a replanting plan, we believe is the most cost effective, as she stated, crunching our numbers quite independently of Ms. Zumach's work. Um, the problem really is that, well, I guess, the, to back up for a second, there's a good thing that's happened. Your state agencies have prepared cities for the planting of small trees through gravel beds, through working with volunteers, and through advice from the university, the Pollution Control Agency, and the DNR to move forward in a more resilient fashion with planting of trees in the future. And we can see our way forward once we can get past this crisis, because it is a crisis. We cannot possibly, as a small city, and many small cities share this, um, come up with the funding to do the injections, the cut downs, and to start this replacement process. We can move forward, though, after that, quite independently and inexpensively. So this, this is what we need. The other thing is, without this, without the ability to replant on boulevards and terraces and on municipal property, I feel like there is an, an evolving environmental justice situation uh, occurring because what will happen is, if we can't replant, the people that can replant will replant, but we have a high percentage of multi-units in our city and we're very close to 694 and a, a very large rail yard. So particulate matter and stormwater wise, the environmental benefits are another matter, but we will not see our poorest neighborhoods be able to replant. So we need dollars to plant small trees and to eject the trees that we do have, and I thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Ms. Qualley. Are there any other testifiers to this bill? Thank you for being here. Please state your name and who you represent and, and proceed with your testimony. Yes, thank you, sir. Uh, my name is Michael Cheney. I am with a nonprofit called Project Sweetie Pie. And um, last year I was here uh, working on the urban egg bill and heard about the project about the ash borer. Uh, we're located at North High and we received some funding from the Healthy Foods Healthy Life. So we proceeded even though last year the funding didn't allow it uh, because there were 22 ash trees 
on the North High. Basically, the whole population on that school grounds was ash. And so hearing the testimony last year, we, we felt that it was critical that we move forward. And so we formed a partnership with Hennepin County, with the city of Minneapolis, the University of Minnesota, and Project Sweetie Pie, and actually planted 60 trees that we, we, we would use to replace the ash that were on the campus there. So um, it was a great partnership. It really moved the, the city and the county to action. And I would, uh, we did it at Earth Day and so it was a great learning opportunity for young people of North High. Uh, we actually did tours through the community looking and trying to assess and do an inventory of what kind of ash tree population was there in North Minneapolis. So I would urge you to think not only for the salvation of the tree population, but also considered as a learning tool and device for the young people in our community as we urge them to understand and appreciate conservation and ecology. Thank you. Excellent point, Mr. Cheney, and I do appreciate the work that you're doing. You do a lot of great work here at North High. Thank you very much. Are there any other testifiers? <coughs> Welcome to the committee. Please state your name and, and who you represent. And proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My name is Dan Ruiz. I am uh, Director of Public Works for the City of Brooklyn Park. And uh, I basically just want to echo what um, the previous testifiers had to say about uh, the Emerald Ash Borer. We in Brooklyn Park do have an Emerald Ash Borer plan. Uh, to implement our plan, uh, the estimated costs are between five and six million dollars between treatment, removal, and replacement of trees. Um, Brooklyn Park is, you know, a, a larger suburb, 80,000 people, 27 square miles, and if we have uh, an impact of five to six million dollars, again, you can extrapolate the cost uh, for managing um, this this disaster as it's approaching. Um, so I just want to uh, lend my support for the bill, Mr. Chair and committee members. Thank you, Mr. Ruiz. Thank you. Is there anyone else who'd like to testify? Okay, members, do we have any questions? Uh, Representative Powell. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I think it's just in the, the reading of the bill um, that I was a bit confused because it talked about the cities of the first class. And I know that that's, as I read it probably that for the third time, I see that that's maybe for the park and rec boards within the cities of the first class. But I'm just wondering if, um, if I'm reading it now correctly that this money would be available for um, cities, counties, towns, but then within cities of the first class, it's only the park and rec boards. And so I don't know if it's for Representative Pearson or um, for staff. If I'm just trying to get Pearson. clarification. Thank Would you. Would you like to answer Thank that? You. I, uh, um, Mr. Chair and Representative Poppy, thanks for the question. I, I think a lot of the testimony that we're hearing probably is pertaining to uh, House File 2032, which is the next bill, um, okay. because I believe you're reading that correctly, that it is for cities of the first class. Ms. Representative Pop. Okay, Mr. Chair, so, so okay, so, um, but we're on 2031, is that correct? correct? Okay, okay, so in both 2031 and 2032, I think it's line 1.8 in 2031, um, 1.7 and 2032, it refers to the cities of the first class. And um, my understanding is we don't have a lot of cities of the first class, and some of the ones that have been coming before you would not be cities of the first class. So right. what I'm thinking is um, that you're restricting, <laughs> and I know you're going to have somebody else who will be able to help answer this, so you're restricting it only to the park and rec boards of the cities of the first class, and maybe it's just my reading of this bill, but I don't know if um, there's any um, clarifying language that maybe needs to be put in to be clearer, or if it's just uh, my reading. So I appreciate that we'll have another um, person to get, provide some information. And I think we have someone who's going to do that. Sir, please uh, state your name and who you represent, and go and answer Representative Poppy's question. Mr. Chairman, Representative Poppy, my name is Kirk Peterson. I'm with the firm of Bryce, Michaels, and Walther. I represent both Hennepin County Environmental Services and the Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board. Um, Minneapolis, as you know, is a city of the first class. We have a separate park and recreation board. It's an autonomously elected body. It's a separate governmental unit within the city. And we handle all of the forestry. The park board handles all of the forestry issues. 
within the city of Minneapolis. So we do all the rights of way, all the park lands, all the parkways, all that stuff falls under the purview of the Minneapolis Park Board. The intent of both of these bills is to make sure that these are statewide grants. Any city, any county, uh, any park district across the state can apply for and receive these funds, but because the park board and several other park districts throughout the state are separate governmental units, we had to have that language in there so that, there, that we would be eligible. Representative Poppy. I think I'll uh, take my other comments offline. I think I'm just thinking it's still maybe could yeah, be we, cleaned we up. Maybe research look into that because I have a little bit of concerns with the way it's worded too. So perhaps you'd like to clarify right now, um, Mr. Chair and Representative Poppy. I think it's a good point, and as drafters, we're always concerned about making clear which nouns are modified <laughs> by certain clauses. I think when when read in context, though. You know, counties in cities of the first class wouldn't make sense. Towns in cities of the right. first class wouldn't make sense. So in my opinion, it's, it's fairly clear that cities of the first class just modifies park and recreation boards, but it could be clarified further. Representative Poppy. Thank you. I'm just, think, I'm just harking back to my, you know, days of Miss Hendrickson and Mrs. Dubbs and, you know, English <laughs> teachers who are helping me with my modification of... Uh, language here. So I appreciate that and uh, um, that's it. Thank you Representative Poppy and I, I would tend to agree. Maybe we'll just want to double check before this moves yeah. forward and get it clarified so that it's accurate. Representative Johnson, did I see that you had it? Okay. Any other, any other questions? Uh, uh, Representative Mahoney. Uh, I, and actually this, I guess this is a question for the testifier, but the comment I would make is if any of the uh, legislators here uh, have want to see something that is pretty visceral and, and hit you right in the face about what Emerald Ashbor is going to do, you should drive down Grand Avenue. There's several hundred ash trees on Grand Avenue. Each one of them is coming down. They have a big green four inch wide ribbon on the trees that are coming down. There's not one tree. There's not an ash tree on Grand Avenue. From below Dale Street all the way to the river that is not coming down. This is one of the commercial arteries of St. Paul. Millions of dollars in sales tax revenue to the state. It will devastate our neighborhoods. Every tree other than the four maples on my street at you know four miles from here is coming down. I have a park with somewhere in the area of 3,200 just in a 100-acre uh, space, 3,200 ash trees that are coming down over the next couple of years because we have a direct connection to the Mississippi River and it's coming up from the south. I mean, just within my, within six blocks of my house, there'll be somewhere in the area of over 1,000 trees gone. And that's four miles from this particular building. So I, I, I appreciate this bill. I uh, don't think it goes far enough for what's going to happen in our state. It's, it's, um, I, you're a little younger than I. Uh, when I was growing up, the emerald, uh, the, the Dutch elm tree was the disease of, of the moment. And my, tr my street that I grew up on, again, four and a half, five miles from here, you, in, Ju in July, you could drive down it from morning to night in shade. You could not see your shadow because the sun was blocked out by the, uh, the, the elm trees. And in the space of less than 30 days, we had no trees on our street. Absolutely none. And I'm, uh, I'm young enough to not remember what George Latimer did or how much the state um, uh, contributed to that particular nightmare. And it really was a nightmare. Um, um, what I would like to find out, so that we can kind of have a historical perspective, is what did the state contribute to the emerald ash, uh, not the emerald ash, but the Dutch elm disease problem. And that was not just a city issue. That was a statewide issue.
from the Iowa border to probably south of Highway 2. I don't think there were a lot of elms up in, in, in the range. Uh, but I would like staff to do some research on this, some digging on what uh, over the four or five year period, because I don't, I know my city is spending close to $2 million a year on the Emerald Ash Board. And we have for the last five or six years. I, Minneapolis is probably no different, or the Park Board in Minneapolis is no different. That This $10 million, although it's a good start, uh, it, it, it is nowhere near what, what we as a state need to contribute to help our cities, whether it's by the Iowa border or by um, Highway 2. Uh, and that's in all places in between. And uh, so if staff could dig that up for me, I would appreciate it. And maybe I'll share it with the, with the committee because I think by the time this is done, this is a hundred million or $200 million issue that we're gonna have to face. Would you like to testify to this? Okay. Cameron, I can also answer. I can take a whack at it, Cameron. Okay. I have a little bit more historical perspective. Uh, that Representative Mahoney is right back when Dutch Elm disease came in in the, in the 70s. The state put considerable amount of resources into it. In the late 70s, between the period of roughly 1976 or 77 up through the mid 80s, they were putting millions of dollars a year. I believe the high mark was in 78 or 79, and they were putting in, the state general fund was putting in between 28 and 29 million dollars a year into statewide grants, and it really helped cities get on top of that. So if you translate that into modern day dollars, we're looking at 70, 80, 90 million dollars a year. Uh, after that, the funding um, kind of went away as cities got on top of it, but then the LCCMR, then the LCM, LCMR had what was called the relief program, and they put several million dollars of continued funding into it uh, at that point for the next decade or so. Looking there, right, Ken? Okay, Representative Mahoney. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and in that perspective, 70 to 90 million dollars a year. Um, we need to really think about this because the flavor of our state, the flavor of our cities and towns and, and, and parks in our small towns and our big towns is really, really important. It's a quality of life issue. And I'll, I, I won't take it into the ag world, I'll take it into the business world. When you're trying to bring people into this state to work and we are facing a workforce shortage in, over the years, they want to live places where there are parks that have trees. They, they want to live places where there is shade, where when they take their two-year-old or their four-year-old or their six-year-old out to the park, they want to be able to sit underneath a tree with a picnic lunch. And if we, do, if we mess this up, if we shortchange it, we're going to be okay. The, you know, the people at this table are going to be okay. But our future depends upon it. How we allow our cities to look depends upon it. And if our cities, whether it's Austin or Albert Lee or St. Paul or Minneapolis go down, it doesn't matter how much money we pour into ag, we will still be a much colder Nebraska. Thank you, Representative. Now, before, we have a couple more uh, questions from members, but before we, before we do that, Representative Poppy uh, did ask for, uh, we do allow for oral amendments and technical changes, and I think that's appropriate at this time. So Representative Poppy, would you like to offer your amendment? Okay, again, I, I apologize uh, for going on this, but I, I would just like to make an oral amendment if this would be okay with everyone. <coughs> so it would be on line 1.8, and I'd just like to add the word the before park and rec boards. So it would be, so it's the grants to cities, counties, towns, and the park and rec boards of cities of the first class. So to me, that um, would further clarify that we're, and if, if it's not acceptable to the, to the author, I'm, I'm, I'm just offering it as a suggestion, and if you don't want to take it, we, we can just move on from here. But I, um, I'm, I think it clarifies the language, and um, Mr. Sullivan thought that it could work, so that's why I'm like to move that amendment. Very good. Representative Pearson? I'm outraged. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like false outrage, Mr. It sounds like a great idea. Thank you, Representative Poppy. And Mr. Chair, I, I, would, I would accept that oral amendment. amendment. Okay, is there any further discussion on that amendment? 
All those in favor? Oh, you have a question that represents Chair Anderson. Yeah, just a question. Are there park and rec boards in smaller cities, or is it just cities of the first class? Who wants, who wants to answer that? I can't answer I, I have an opinion, but that probably doesn't count as official an official Mr. answer. Chair. Go ahead. Go ahead, Mr. Representative Pearson. Well, Mr. Chair, I think um, what's unique about cities of the first class is that they have their own elected uh, bodies that that are their park and recreation boards, and in, 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 and they they can actually uh, administer some of these programs on their own versus being a department within a city, which is is I think more traditional in the in the smaller towns of, of smaller than the first cities of the first class. Chair Anderson. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Chair. Yeah, th that sounds like it makes sense. I just don't want to exclude anybody that, that may need these funds at, at some point down the road. And, and, and if this is fine, I, I'm okay with that. But we, it, it does now really are just saying park boards in the first class. But if, but if that works, that's, that's okay. And I think what we'll do is, is I'll, I'll uh, Representative Erdahl. No, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. And did you answer Representative Anderson's question? Uh, there are all kinds of park and rec boards across the state of Minnesota that aren't first class. Well, they're first class, but not <laughs> cities of the first class. So, so I think what we're going to do, we're going to go ahead and move on with this amendment. And uh, I would, uh, is it to this amendment? Because we, this bill is going to be laid over. So if there's any of these technical questions that are being raised, I think we can get it corrected as it moves on. But if you still want to respond to that, Representative Johnson, I'd be fine. Yeah, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I had a similar question, but on the other end, uh, Representative Anderson, do all cities of the first class have an elected park and recreation board? And if they don't, are they still eligible? <coughs> We got to make sure they're eligible for these funds. Uh, Mr. Mr. Peterson, I think you have an answer. Mr. Chairman, to my, I, within cities of the first class, Minneapolis is the only one that has an autonomously elected park board. <coughs> Most other cities have park and rec departments that are within the city, report to the city council or the mayor or with, uh, to a department within. The city of St. Paul does not have a separate park board. It has a, it has a parks department or a parks division. Um, commission. Commission. Um, so, to the best of my, I, I know we're the only one in the first class cities that has its own park board. Other cities yeah. may or may not, but I think most of them are just yeah. within departments. Okay, I think what we're going to do is there's been enough discussion, enough questions that don't have total answers yet. This is going to be held over. I think what we'll do is we'll answer those questions. As it proceeds forward, we'll get it clarified so that the, would you, would you Mr. be Chair, I will, I will withdraw the amendment, so thank you. Representative Poppy withdraws her uh, oral amendment. Uh, we are going to get back on track here. We have a couple more um, members that do want to ask questions and I want to give you time to answer your questions but do remember that we are on the clock and we do have room 300 north scheduled for this evening should we have to come back we still have three more bills so just be understanding of that I'm more than happy to be here. Uh, so the next one in line is Representative Jurgens. your question. Thank you Mr. Chair. Quick question I'm not sure who it's for but I, it my question has to do with the source of the of the bonds. Would these be general obligation bonds or appropriation bonds, or where would this come from? And Mr. Chair, based on a conversation or a meeting we were in yesterday, you understand the source of my question. Absolutely, Representative. Uh, Representative Pearson, would you like to answer that? Yeah, uh, in this bill, it's geo bonds, but uh, geo bonds can't be used for the treatment of the trees, which will be in the next bill. Representative Jurgens. That's good. Thank you. Okay, uh, Representative Hansen. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I think it's just following up on Representative Mahoney's uh, question about context and dollars. Uh, looking back at 2009, uh, 2008 we passed a, a constitutional amendment to protect, restore, and enhance forest wetlands and prairies, uh, forests. So right now that's clocking in at about $115 million a year. In 2009, the first year of the appropriations, because right when Emerald Ash Borer was detected, uh, the appropriation was added by the legislature to the council's recommendations. It was an additional $2 million that was added. And it passed, that was Governor Pawlenty. <coughs> and uh, the interests who believe that the money for the Outdoor Heritage Fund is theirs actually wanted that $2 million vetoed, line item vetoed from the bill because they felt that 
that was an inappropriate use of the money and it was inappropriate for the legislature to uh, insert that $2 million. That $2 million is the only $2 million that has been provided by, uh, by the people of Minnesota. $2 million. Now, I've been in that dock, and I'll be in here right after this, I think, Mr. Chair, as have many others trying to get additional dollars for this. Um, and it's not a question of the money not being around. We have a $1.6 billion surplus if we want to use general fund. We have the bonding capacity if we want to use bonding. And we have money that's constitutionally dedicated to protect, restore, and enhance forests, of which trees are forests when they're in concentration in urban or suburban or rural areas. So Representative Green, same issue. People who want the money for their purpose, for acquisition and other things that may not be protecting the forest, uh, but it's buying land. So we've got a few more years to go in the Constitutional Amendment. The only other dollars that have been used have been through the LCCMR, which is not enough to have an ongoing program. If we had just taken that $2 million and put each year, and Representative Erdahl, you've been through these battles too, $2 million each year to communities, we'd be holding back the Emerald Ash Bore more than we have. But we didn't do that. So at some point, we have to take action. We have to take action to meet this crisis. Um, we thought we were going to take action last year. The federal government, there's no more money for this coming from the federal government. So um, the dollars are there. Leadership will re require that all of us work together to try to get some dollars to arrest this pest. Thank you, Representative Hanson. Now, Representative Johnson, I had you on the list, but that was to the other question. Okay, uh, Representative Pearson, any closing comments? Well, to uh, Representative Hanson's point, uh, Mr. Chair, I, I would point out that all the dollars come from people in the state of Minnesota. It's just whether that's on a city by city level or, or the state uh, general fund and, and these bonding dollars that, that we're asking for really does just spread that, spread that out uh, for everyone rather than targeted within the cities that, that are immediately impacted and benefited by this. So uh, again, I, I think the state of Minnesota here is, is putting a good step, good faith effort forward. And uh, with this and House File uh, 2032 as well, I, I think we can get things going in the right direction. And, and uh, I was actually just bringing up, I'm not opposed to looking at those legacy dollars as well for the same cause um, and, and think that that would be an appropriate uh, Revisit. I know it was controversial, and that was something that was brought up to me uh, in this discussion. But uh, we're, we're looking to all solutions at this point. Real good. Thank you, Representative Pearson. House File 2031 will be laid over. Thank you. <laughs> Moving right on to House File 2032. Would you just like to pick up where you left off? There? I'd love to, and uh, I was going to make everyone come back and say the exact same thing, <laughs> um, but I, I guess some folks would prefer to move on. So uh, again, House File uh, uh, 2032 um, really actually ends up putting more into uh, dollars invested in, in uh, treatment and, and planning and, and mitigating some of the issues that we're dealing with uh, on the Emerald Ash Borer. And so with that, I'll, uh, I'll open it up to questions, I think. I don't know if we need to have any, any more additional testimony on okay. the bill. Uh, Chair, I'll uh, yes, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to know what the, the motion is on this uh, for dispensation here. Uh, is it laid over? Does it go to capital investment or what happens? Excellent question. This will be laid over for inclusion. This bill will be laid over for inclusion, possible inclusion of the agriculture omnibus bill. 2031. 2032. Oh, I'm sorry. We, yeah, we're doing 2031. 32, it's I just had these inverted. I apologize. Hold on one second. We had them one way, and now we switched them back. And let me get on top of this for a second. 2031 was the bonding bill. I apologize. So 2031, yeah, so we did that one right. This is 2032 is the agriculture bill. So this will be laid over for possible inclusion in the agriculture omnibus bill. I had it right the first time, Mr. Chair, and you. Let's hold on a second here. 
House file 2031 we did first, which was the bonding bill. And I did hold that over. We moved on to House file 2032, which is being held over for consideration uh, for inclusion in the agriculture omnibus bill. They both are being held over. Correct. For possible inclusion in the agriculture. The, the, the first one, the bonding, I cannot hold over for possible inclusion because I am not the chair of the bonding committee. Right. So, Mr. Mr. Chair. Oh. Hold on one second, Representative Mahoney. If and uh, you, you know you get to do what you want. I talked to the bonding chair, but 2031 probably should have been passed on to the bonding committee rather than held over for possible inclusion. Because if it's a bonding bill, it's it's the guy with the cane, and I'd never start to get in a fight with a guy with a cane. <laughs> So it's uh, up to you how you want to do it, but uh, m staff can probably tell you exactly how to do it, but I think we'd probably have to recall a 2031 and pass it to the bonding committee. Which is correct. That was the, in that so was if I need the direction to make a we were to going to go. I can make a motion to reconsider House File 2031 and uh, forward that to the bonding Well, to that motion, I'd like Representative Erdahl to make a comment on that. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and that's what I was thinking. Uh, and also, another <coughs> problem, I mean, if, if this is general obligation bonds, then are you, by putting this in the Ag Bill, not that it wouldn't anyway, uh, but aren't you re requiring a two-thirds uh, supermajority to pass the Ag Bill? Uh, Representative Verdahl, when we were holding it over, we were not holding it over for uh, inclusion in the omnibus bill. We were just holding it over. So to Representative, uh, saying, but to, you, to Representative Pearson's uh, statement to reconsider is that something that your committee would like us to do uh, yes okay so members what we're going to do is it, representative Pearson to your motion I, w I would like to move to reconsider house file 2031 that takes a vote correct that takes a vote Okay, members, we are going to accept uh, Representative Pearson's uh, motion to reconsider House File 2031 and re for re-referral. Do I do that at this time? It takes two votes. Okay, so reconsider, reconsider House File 2031. Any questions? All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Okay, now I'd like to uh, move that we refer this to the uh, Capital Investment Committee. Okay, Representative Pearson moves that we. Mr. Chair, um, I'm just looking around. It's, okay, never mind. Okay. Uh, Representative Pearson asks that we re refer House File 2031 to Capital Investment Committee. Any, any questions, conversations? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Okay, now we're on to House File 2032. Back to where you were at with that. Representative Pearson. I'll renew my motion to have it be included in the, or I'm sorry, for possible inclusion in the agriculture omnibus bill. Okay, would you, any further comments on that at this time? Are there any questions from the members at this time? No, this one. Okay, I will renew Representative Pearson's motion to include House File 2032. For possible inclusion in the agriculture omnibus bill, it is being or it is being held over for possible inclusion. Thank you. Okay, we're going to move right along. <coughs> Representative Hansen, to your House File 1621. And this will be for possible inclusion in the agriculture omnibus bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd move House File 1621 for possible inclusion in the Ag Finance Bill. Um, Mr. Chair and members, uh, we have some buzzing. I think it's me. Um, House File 1621 is the what I was just referencing on the previous bill. This would be uh, an appropriation from the general fund to the Department of Agriculture uh, in consultation with the Forest Resources Council to provide grants to local units of government. You should be getting uh, a historical document from 2009 
that shows where the money went uh, last time. And you will see that it was distributed uh, to local units of government around the state. I think all of them being first class cities, not cities of the first class. But uh, I believe this appropriation did help stall Emerald Ash Borer. And I think at a minimum, uh, while I support and am co-author on the other two bills, this is something that should be done and should be ongoing to help our local units of government as the pest continues to spread. I was uh, reminded last night by uh, Representative Schultz that it, uh, Emerald Ash Borer was just found at Hartley Nature Center in Duluth. Uh, and that was a new <coughs> detection just yesterday. Uh, I expect we're going to continue to have more. Um, I believe there may be some testifiers. Uh, I have a constituent here that uh, would like to testify in support of it, and I would ask for your consideration. Okay, Representative, thank you. Um, do we have that testifier here at this time? Welcome to our committee. Please state your name and who you represent for the record. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Hanson. My name is Michael Orange. Um, I have an environmental consulting company called Orange Environmental, and I am a member of MinStack, Minnesota Shade Tree Advisory Committee. I will be brief, and I'll be bringing to you a lot of numbers. Um, uh, Ms. Uh, uh, Karen Zumach has done a great job of giving you a, a, a very good picture of our of our group's efforts and the um, importance of this uh, of, of this effort. And I want to instead uh, focus in on what it might cost the state to do what we want you to do. Uh, it goes back three years when I was working with uh, Jeffrey Hafner, who's with Rainbow Tree Care and here today, and also Dr. Robert Haight, who is a an economist with the U.S. Forest Service, and we developed an ash tree preservation program um, and did a cost-benefit analysis of what, it would, what we would want the state to do on a state program of grants to local communities and to, um, to see what those costs would, would, would happen and what would be the benefits. So we used two scenarios, a base case where uh, that we assumed that the state would deal with the with the infestation the same way the cities back east had to, which was try to eliminate the food supply, cut down all the ash trees and replace them if they could. That's the base case. And then what we have been proposing is that cities would complete inventories, <coughs> select their best public trees and protect them, inoculate them with emamectin benzoate, a, uh, a pesticide that is not a neonicotinoid. And um, and just the best trees, and then also replace those that are low quality trees. And we did that comparison, the base case versus what we call the ash tree preservation plan. So over a 20 year study period, we concluded that the program, the state funds, would be about $250 million. That's what you're looking at uh, for what is really needed. Or what we really need uh, by our analysis is $12.3 million on average each year in state funding. What do you get for that? The, uh, uh, Karen Zumach told you that an ash tree, an average ash tree gives you about $165 worth of overall economic benefits every year. Translate that into the, all the ash trees that would be preserved and you would have a benefit of about $180 million worth of tree benefits on top of the base case on average every year. If you looked at it from a cost per inch, in other words, um, a dollar of, for every dollar, program dollar that goes in on a per inch of uh, tree diameter that's saved, you, you have, um, uh, you get, the base case costs three times as much. It costs three times as much to tear them down and replace them than it does to preserve the best trees. We've been saying this for three years. If you look at it from a, from a program dollar standpoint, every dollar, every state dollar you could invest in a program such as this will translate into $14 in overall economic value every year uh, over the 20 year study period. It also translates into $28 million more in increased property value. Again, ATP plant versus the base case. Stormwater management, an extremely important component. 1.8 billion additional gallons of stormwater management per year 
if you preserve the best trees in the state. We also looked at it in terms of the energy conservation aspects and tried to put it instead of uh, into terms that made sense and put it in terms of an average household energy consumption for an average household in Minnesota. And it turns out that the trees that could be preserved and, and replaced uh, would translate to 17,500 uh, household equivalencies in terms of energy. And then um, in terms of carbon dioxide, greenhouse gases, uh, it almost uh, over 2,000 homes a year would be the equivalent benefit. And finally, we know that these trees reduce public uh, uh, human health costs. They, they're healthy for us, we know that. And in fact, uh, the, the base case comparison is $800,000 a year in additional health costs, uh, reducing costs. And to Representative Mahoney's uh, comment about the past investment of the state in, to deal with the Dutch elm disease, we did that calculation. And in today's dollars, the state of Minnesota helped cities and communities at the rate of more than a half a billion dollars, more than $500 million in today's dollars. And as has been pointed out, today we've invested $2 million. We need this program. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ernst. Uh, Representative Hanson, I have a question for you. I see it's an open appropriation that you have on this bill. Is there a dollar figure that you're kind of looking at or thinking of? Well, Mr. Chair, uh, you just heard the, what is needed. I would, at a minimum, like the $2 million uh, that we had in 2009. And that's a real bare minimum. Okay, thank you. Are there any, is there anyone else who wishes to testify for or against this bill at this time? Questions by the members? Yeah, Mr. Chair. Uh, Representative Mahoney. How come you think so small? It should be at least five or 10 or $12 million if we're gonna make an addent in this. Representative Hansen. Well, uh, Representative Mahoney, I've been here in this place year after year and get, got zero. Mm -hmm. And so I'm hoping that by asking for a smaller amount that we would actually get it. And I would you know, just go back to the science that uh, Mr. Orange provided, the benefits that are there. And I would ask, or maybe beg you, that who is supposed to speak for the trees? Not just the Lorax, but all of you around this room, all of the people that are here, who speaks for the trees? We have to do something. Uh, Representative Pearson, you're absolutely right. If the state doesn't, the local governments are gonna be absorbing this cost. They are already absorbing this cost. And so um, some of them can't. Some of them don't have the ability or the capacity to do that, particularly smaller towns. Um, so again, I would ask you to speak for the trees, to put the dollars up for these trees, and let's at least do a minimum uh, that hopefully we could build upon for the future. Okay, thank you, Representative Hansen. Uh, House File 1621 is gonna be laid over for possible inclusion in the Omnibus Agricultural Bill. Thank you. Chair. Uh, Representative Bly. Uh, I think Representative Eklund had a question. I apologize, I did not see that. I, I greatly apologize. That, I really that's right, Mr. Chair, that. it was just a comment. I agree with Representative Mahoney, but now with, uh, with uh, um, Emerald Ashbor being discovered in Duluth, we're gonna face a bigger issue with the counties and the private landowners in northern Minnesota that are holding thousands of acres of ash trees and it'll end up being a water issue down the road so we really need to get a handle on what's going on here. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Eklund, and I apologize for not seeing you uh, before we moved on. Moving on with this, uh, uh, the next bill on the docket is supposed to be Chair Hamilton and I'm not seeing here at this time. Okay. So we are going to move on to Representative uh, Lai's bill. Representative, we do have, I want to give you full time for your bill, but we do have testifiers for Hamilton's and we need to make sure that we keep this in time. So let's move forward to your bill and we'll, we'll get this done. Okay, Representative Bly brings forward um, House File 1076. Would you like to move your bill, Representative Bly? Yeah, is this being held over for possible inclusion? Yeah. Correct. So I'd like to move uh, House File 1076 for possible inclusion in the Ag Finance. Thank you, Representative Bly, to your bill. Um, so we're, we're going to hear a little bit about uh, something called Forever Green, 
Uh, I've come before this committee uh, for several years to ask for uh, funding. And I don't want to take a lot of uh, time because I want to give the time to my uh, testifiers. Just I would draw your attention to a couple of uh, uh, media outlets that have praised uh, Forever Green and announced that General Mills is joining in and in, in, uh, helping to fund uh, this work, which I think will um, uh, give farmers uh, multiple choices in the future and, and may even be uh, uh, the future of agriculture. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to the testifier. Thank you, Representative Bly and testifiers. I do want to give you plenty of time, but also understand that we are under time constraints. So please keep your comments to specifically what it is you wanted to address. And to that, uh, first testifier, name and uh, who you represent. Yes, thank you. Uh, my name is Craig Schaefer. Uh, I work in the University of Minnesota and College of Agriculture. Uh, I do research and teaching and I really want to thank you for the opportunity to come down here because every time I've done this, and it's been a just a few times, it's been very educational. I've learned a lot about how the government works. I have a number of colleagues with me um, and I'll, I'll go through it and some of them are going to testify in a minute. There's Kayla Altendorf, uh, who's, a, who's a graduate student in, um, to read these off, I guess, uh, in the uh, Department of Agronomy and Plant Genetics. Gabe Gusimi from PepsiCo. Jim Anderson, who's a plant breeder in the Department of Agronomy and Plant Genetics. Cody Herring, a graduate student. Kevin Dorn, who's a research associate or park, park, uh, postdoc working in genomics. Catherine Frails, who works on pennycrest breeding. As, as well as Matthew Odd, who works on the agronomics of um, Pennycrest and Camelina. These are all people from the university and also from PepsiCo who are our partners working together in this. I understand, uh, if I could begin, sir, uh, that you all have this booklet in front of you, some version of it. It describes in detail about the program and all the different crops. And I'm just going to start off by reviewing some features of this. Um, first, why forever green and what does it mean? What does it mean to be a forever green crop? Well, these forever green crops are a new generation of crops which will provide year-round ground cover, in some cases multiple year ground cover on the landscape. By doing this, they're going to protect natural resources. They're going to look at improving uh, the water and soil quality. And uh, I think you, all of you are aware of the recent reports from from the Minnesota Department of Agriculture, um, in, in, uh, as well as Department of Health, about issues in water quality in, this, in the state. Well, <clears throat> these crops do more than uh, just uh, protect the environment. I shouldn't use the term just here. But they also are valuable in that they do also provide uh, economic incentive to grow them. So growers who would use these crops, such as on buffer, buffer strips, on wellhead protection zones, not only will improve the environment, but there will be an economic incentive for doing it. And so uh, tremendous benefit from these, these types of crops. The, uh, the program, the Forever Green Initiative program, also looks at developing value chain, supply chain work, going from production all the way to all the way through to marketing. And another feature of it, and I mentioned economic incentives, really deals with rural communities which may be processing this associated with growers and marketing it. And so we see a tremendous opportunity here for jobs and, and community development. So it's environment and economics together. Now, what crops am I talking about? If you turn the page, page number two, which isn't numbered, um, <laughs> doesn't work though. Uh, there's a list of crops in this blue box. There's about 15 of them. There's probably some of the crops that we're working on on a very preliminary basis that aren't listed. But if you look closely, there are four little boxes here. There's a, a box with a plant with uh, plant with blue flowers or purple flowers. And this is perennial flax. Maybe some of you know about an annual flax. Some of you may be wearing linen right now, which is made from flax stem. Maybe some of you are consuming flax seed that's uh, supposedly good for your heart and your brain. All of these things can come from flax, but it's an annual. We're talking about growing it as a perennial, so it can be grown for many years and you get those ecosystem advantages, not only the economics. 
we've got a long way to go on this. This is one of the reasons we need some more funding to move this kind of crop along. Also in these boxes, there's some hazelnuts. It's a picture of a hazelnut flower. And this is a crop that we moved along. It's a nut. It's a perennial nut. Maybe some of you have it. It is the best nut to use with dark chocolate. Some of it have it in your coffee. I wish I had. We have samples. No, we don't. It's a good nut. Right now in the United States and Minnesota, we import a lot of hazelnuts from Europe and Turkey. We ought to be growing these ourselves from an economic standpoint. Jobs, it goes to jobs. Plus, these are perennial, you get environmental benefits. Also picture here is pennycrest, which we are domesticating to use as an oil crop. And this is a crop that will fit well as a winter annual with, in a rotation with sugar beets, soybeans, and then finally at the bottom we have intermediate wheatgrass. Representative Bly just mentioned the re recent development creates a tremendous market force. If you get the Star and Tribune, talks about General Mills being excited about this. And uh, the title is A Grain with Staying Power. So perennial, uh, rye, uh, perennial uh, wheatgrass or Kernza is a grain you, produce, you plant and it will produce for multiple years. There's no annual tillage. There's no annual carbon burnout. And it sucks a lot of nitrogen from the soil. We have some seed of it here, which we could pass around if you'd be interested in looking to it. So, Kale, I don't know. Uh, uh, pardon me, uh, Mr. Schaefer, if, if you could wrap it up in about a minute or two. I don't, I don't want to squeeze the time, but I'm kind of squeezed for time. Okay. So I apologize. Okay, that's fine. I also want to mention that we have a team of people, uh, like General Mills, like uh, uh, PepsiCo, we work with agencies like the Minnesota Department of Agriculture, Minnesota Department of Health on wellhead protection issues. We work with nonprofits and their growers. So we, we have connections. I also want to mention Ari, who's working with us on processing of the uh, Pennycrest seed. So we look at this as a team effort. We look at using these funds that are going to be provided here to stimulate our activity. Those of you know, we already do get some funds from the state of Minnesota. We want to actually enhance those to look at more crops. In the end, we want to benefit the state of Minnesota. And um, I know there's a lot of um, requests for monies, for funds. We think this is worthwhile. And our college has delivered on corn, soybeans, wheat, barley. We can deliver on this for you. And everybody will benefit. Thank you, uh, and I don't know if it's Mr. or Dr. Schaefer. I have professors, so I don't know if it is Mr. or Dr. You can call me Craig. <laughs> okay, real good. Thank you very much, uh, Craig, uh, Mr. Schaefer, and um, to our next testifier. Please state your name and who you represent for the record, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Committee. My name is Kayla Altendorf, and I'm a graduate student in the Applied Plant Sciences program at the University of Minnesota. So I want to thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Um, I want to talk to you about two products that come out of the Forever Green Initiative. Uh, the first one is a, a group of talented students that are prepared to take on the challenges of improving agriculture in the future and new crops for Minnesota and beyond. <coughs> so for my bachelor's degree, um, I received a Bachelor of Arts in Environmental Studies and I was learning repeatedly about all the problems with annual agriculture. And when I graduated, I was so excited I wanted to be a part of the solution. And in order to be a part of the solution, I needed to obtain the technical skills to become a plant breeder, to develop new crops. And I contacted an organization in Kansas called the Land Institute, which is the leader in new crop um, domestication. And I said, where should I go to graduate school? And they said, contact Don Wise, Forever Green, University of Minnesota. It's the place to go to study this. So here I am working on my second degree in the program. Um, <clears throat> And I just want to mention that when I go to conferences with my Forever Green colleagues and fellow students, our work really stands out and it's incredibly unique to what's going on at other universities around the country. So two things to highlight here. Um, Forever, the Forever Green Initiative is positioning the University of Minnesota and the state of Minnesota as a leader in the development of sustainable uh, agriculture. And two, this program is really attracting uh, a lot of talented students from around the country because this program is so unique. And it's attracting students that aren't just growing up on farms um, and learning about agriculture that way. They're students who are motivated by the environmental benefits of these systems. 
And then just one more thing I want to highlight. Uh, for my PhD project, I'm working on intermediate wheatgrass, which is a perennial form of wheat. Um, and recently I gave a talk on my, on my work and people in the crowd were cheering and they weren't cheering at me, they were cheering about the idea and the product of, of intermediate wheatgrass or Kernza. They're so excited. Um, I recently spoke to a farmer about perennial wheat um, and he said, I thought that was just a pipe dream, but I'm here to tell you today that it's in the news, this is happening. Um, and it's something that's come out of our program uh, in part with our collaborators as well. So, <clears throat> Just want to uh, finish up by saying, reiterating that this, this pro program develops students that will be leaders in this uh, movement in the future, as well as new crops. And um, I think, like I, I mentioned before, the state of Minnesota and our land grant university are really leading this effort, and, and we want to maintain our role uh, in the leadership. So, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Altendorf. And next up to testify is Mr. Gabe Gusmini. I don't know if I pronounced that. Please state your name and who you represent. And for the remaining testifiers, I still have another bill with the chair that's coming behind this. And so if you could keep it, I apologize, but relatively brief, uh, we'd like to wrap up the testimony here in about the next five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm Gabe Guzmini. I'm the R&D Director for Crop Sciences at PepsiCo. And I'm the last testifier, so that will have to be our really schedule. Um, I'll just take a couple of minutes. I want to... Um, explain why PepsiCo is supporting the Forever Green program and why we're excited about it as a food company. Uh, the Forever Green program is, uh, to my knowledge, one of the very few programs around the world that's bringing new crops into the food supply. And we are uh, looking forward and striving to identify new crops that can help our companies in fulfilling our strategy of improving nutrition uh, with an awesome approach. Um, the additional benefit of the Forever Green crops is that because of their ecosystem services, they help to lessen the impact in the environment of the core crops that also flow through our plants and into our food products. So there is double benefit that, uh, that, that these crops bring, both in, uh, in enhancing the value of the products that come out of our factory and in decreasing the environmental impact, so meeting the sustainability commitments that our companies have made. And I do believe that most likely other companies, uh, other, our competitors have similar intents, and that's why this program is being discussed as a great program for cooperation across the food industry, not just for competitive behaviors. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Members, are there any questions? Representative Johnson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, for the last testifier. I, if I could just get, I, I don't, I'm not asking for trade secrets, but I'm, I'm curious about what do you see as the potential long-term um, role of this? What's the economic impact of this going, going forward? How big a market do, we, do you see envisioned for the, the products that you're working with? Sure. Um, Guess me. Guess so me. The, is that these that products, correct? Me? Yeah, that's correct. Okay. Perfect. Uh, these products are uh, now in development. So the, the question now, and that's why the funding is required, is how can they be scaled up into supply chains and into what products that can be deployed. But to give you some point of reference, uh, every day around the world, 1.5 billion times a day, someone is experiencing a PepsiCo product. So if you imagine just uh, bringing these products into 10% of those experiences, gives you an idea of the magnitude of production that could eat the state of Minnesota and other states, because even just deploying them in the state of Minnesota at that point isn't going to be enough to create all the supply that's needed. And then if you link that into the benefit that they bring in, in reducing the environmental footprint of agriculture, you can see that that magnitude translates also in an immediate benefit for the other crops that go alongside them. Does that help contextualizing? Representative Johnson? Yeah, and thank you. Thank you very much. And I, and I just want to take advantage of the moment to compliment PepsiCo and General Mills are two of the companies that I know that are deeply involved in this. It's progressive uh, business. And, and I, uh, it's, it's really quite exciting because that market's got to be there for this yeah. to work. And you're, the role that you folks are playing is critical, and thank you for that. Thank you very much. Any other questions? Representative Bly? Final comments? Um, I, I think you get a sense of uh, how excited, exciting this uh, program is and uh, what it holds for the future. So I renew my uh, motion to uh, uh, 
have the bill be held over for possible inclusion. Representative Bly, you'll be happy to know that you and I can agree on some <laughs> things. And this Forever Green project is actually, I've had uh, some local farmers that I've talked to about this. We're doing a test plot down in Renville County. The key to, for me is that it needs to be economically beneficial, yeah. and that's going to be the key thing that we're going to have to do. So Representative Bly uh, renews his motion. House file 1076 will be laid over for possible inclusion in the omnibus agricultural bill. Thank you, Representative. One final thing. I yep. wanted to thank you for your uh, interest in this, and I, I was aware of that, and so uh, thanks for uh, being involved. Absolutely. Thank you. Our final bill today, least but certainly not least, or not least but certainly not least, last but certainly not least. <laughs> well, there was a Freudian slip there, I suppose, Chair. <laughs> I, guess I, I guess I owe you a lunch after this. <laughs> Mr. Chair, who picked your vice chair? Yeah, that's right. Right? Yeah. It wasn't me. <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> Have that one coming. Uh, Mr. Chair, Representative Hamilton, two-year bill, House File 1370. Would you like to move it, please? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'll move House File 1370 be held over for possible inclusion. This is the Good Food Access Program. In essence, the time I would really like to hear from the testifiers. Absolutely. So, Mr. Chairman, with your permission, I'd like to turn it over to them at this time. Mr. Chair, turn it over, please. Please state your name and who, who you're with uh, for the record. Thank, Thank you. you. My name is Erin Meyer, and I direct the University of Minnesota Extension Southeast Regional Sustainable Development Partnership. I'm here to speak about current food access challenges and emerging solutions that we've identified through research. Unfortunately, when, when it comes to the access to grocery stores and healthy, affordable foods, hundreds of thousands of Minnesotans reside in what are considered now food deserts. Situated in metro and non-metro regions of the, uh, in the state alike, these locations are experiencing a loss of grocery stores, making it difficult for local residents to access healthy and affordable foods. The U of M Extension Regional Partnerships recently surveyed rural grocery store owners. We found that 62% of respondents plan to own their stores for only another 10 years at most, and the vast majority do not have a transition plan in place to help ensure that the store will continue. Survey respondents also reported that their buildings are aging and in need of maintenance, and including, and most importantly, more energy efficient equipment. These findings are troubling because these stores are a primary source of fresh produce in the communities they serve, foods that are critical to meeting the health needs of Minnesotans. The findings, the findings go from troubling to traumatic when you consider that Greater Minnesota has already experienced a staggering loss of grocery stores. 53 of the state's 87 counties experienced a decline in the number of stores per 1,000 residents between 2007 and 2012. Minnesota's Center for Rural Policy and Development found that between 2010 and 2013, there's a 14% reduction in grocery stores in the rural parts of our state. And even in my relatively prosperous corner of the state, Southeast Minnesota, nearly every county I serve has identified areas of food deserts and some of significantly large regions of those counties that have barriers to healthy foods. And towns that seem stable and successful in many ways do not have grocery stores like Lanesboro, which many of you know and enjoy uh, those bike paths but they don't have a grocery store. They get their food at a gas station. Fortunately, efforts to help rural grocery stores and communities where they are located are underway. The Minnesota Good Food Access Program provides lawmakers an opportunity to invest in a range of meaningful solutions benefiting grocery store owners and consumers alike. Other efforts are taking place as well. At U of M Extension, we're exploring ways to help rural stores become more profitable, thus making them more sustainable in the long term. One example is that we were just awarded a USDA grant to trial rural grocery stores' ability to serve as docking points for small and medium-sized food crop producers to access whole, wholesale markets. Doing so could benefit producers, store owners, and communities. Rural groceries could transform from being pass, a passive endpoint for a, a global food distribution system uh, to being more of an active market participant playing a pivotal, pivotal role in wholesale distribution of local food and healthy food in rural areas and metro markets. But for this and other ideas to take root, we have to stem the loss of rural grocery stores. It is important that Minnesotans work collectively to figure out ways to preserve these stores, encourage new stores to locate where others are closing, and develop new innovative community-based design solutions to improve access to healthy and affordable foods. The more we can do to close the divide that currently exists between Minnesotans who have access to good food and those who don't, the better off we all will be. Not only does the future of the health of Minnesota depend on this, so does the economic health of our communities. Thank you for your time today. Thank you, Ms. Meyer. Uh, next to testify is Ms. Pam Bishop. 
Please state your name, who you're with, for the record, please. Good morning, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. My name is Pam Bishop. I'm the Executive Vice President with the Southern Minnesota Initiative Foundation. We are a regional develop development and philanthropic organization. We foster economic and community vitality in the 20 counties that we serve in Southern Minnesota. I am here to voice my support for the Good Food Access Program. And as a member of the philanthropic community and advisory committee member working to support the program's successful implementation with the Department of Agriculture. The philanthropic community of Minnesota invests significant resources into addressing foods insecurity and improving food access solutions across the state. And we are extremely excited about the opportunity to align our resources with the state of Minnesota through the Good Food Access Program. The program was modeled off successful healthy financing initiatives, efforts across other states, including states like Pennsylvania, Michigan, and North Carolina. Similar to Minnesota, these efforts have brought together a diverse interest of stakeholders who share a common goal, make it easier to access healthy, affordable food. The results have reopened grocery stores in areas that have long been shuttered improve the offerings of fresh fruits and vegetables at corner and convenience stores, and have connected local agricultural producers for those uh, who lack good access to good food. For example, between 20 or 2004 and 2010, the Pennsylvania Fresh Food Financing Initiative funded 88 projects for fresh food retail, created or preserved 5,000 jobs, and over 400,000 Pennsylvanians gained improved access to healthy food. Healthy food financing initiatives provide the opportunity to foster collaboration between public and private stakeholders, allowing flexibility for range of stakeholders to leverage their resources and unique expertise. In similar model efforts across the country, public seed money has played a significant role in leveraging dollars as much as a three to one match in private investments to bring programs to scale necessary to meet the demand. Last year's legislation establishing the program with $250,000 in seed money for the program's first year of operation has already become a catalyst for private funders to explore our role in supporting the Good Food Access Program. The Minnesota Food Funders Network, which I co-chair, a statewide funding collaborative as a meeting scheduled on Monday next week to bring philanthropic partners together to discuss how we can align our resources to support this important initiative. We know this program's success requires a strong commitment for both the private and public sectors to adequately support good food access solutions from across the state. Just for an example, the cost of a single energy efficient produce cooler that will help produce produce last at least three days longer cost about $10,000. It's been estimated that there is an immediate need for 300 of these coolers in small grocery stores across Minnesota. And to use just one example of a co-op grocery store in greater Minnesota working with the Small Business Development Commission to chart their financials, it will take approximately $280,000 between equipment, inventory, startup costs, and working capital. Getting access to capital can be a significant barrier for grocery stores and other food entrepreneurs, and it is critical that the Good Food Access Program get the resources necessary to build the revolving loan program to address that challenge. We are committed to leveraging the resources needed to make the Good Food Access Program a success. And we strongly urge you to fully fund the program by providing a 10 million annual appropriation to bring the program to scale and to provide the long-term commitment needed to address our state's critical food access challenges. I will tell you in Southern Minnesota, the Southern Minnesota Initiative Foundation has been a long-standing partner in the last five years specifically. We have helped small towns rebuild small grocery stores. We've helped communities design infrastructure to connect agricultural producers to consumers who are eager to eat and find local produce. Keister is a great example of a small town wanting to revitalize their community. And we have been in there tirelessly with funding, with coaching and mentoring to help that grocery store 
revamp what they want to do and to bring local foods to the marketplace. Farmhouse Market in Northfield is an innovative model, a 24-7 operation very similar to any kind of exercise shop you might find. It supports the key needs of a community and providing local access 24-7. Good Thunder, outside of Mankato, a very small community, is eager to, re to continue with their convenience store. It will provide local food access and is at least 15 miles out of the Mankato area. Lanesboro Local, as mentioned earlier in Lanesboro, a dynamic small town, very isolated from any sort of large metropolitan area, a key tourism destination, has been struggling for years to continue to keep their grocery store open. I will tell you, they have found an innovative way to do that, and so you can expect to find good food and local access once again in Lanesboro. Dodge County has been exploring how do we develop a co-op in this area. There is a strong need for that, but financing <clears throat> continues to be a barrier. And the Wabasha area is also another example of how finding ways to create an environment and infrastructure to support local food uh, is strongly uh, needed. I thank you today for your time, and I'm happy to answer any questions uh, following the test testimonials here. Thank, thank you, Ms. You. Bishop. Um, our final testifier on the list is um, Mr. Sharman. Please state your name and who you represent and proceed with your testimony. Thank you for being here today. Thank you. Good morning, uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Luke Sharman, and I live in Duluth, Minnesota, where I coordinate volunteers for CHUM. I do grassroots work to improve food access. I'm speaking today as a part of the Fair Food Access Campaign, which has spent the last four years working with residents to increase food security in the Lincoln Park neighborhood in Duluth. Lincoln Park is a low-income urban neighborhood on the St. Louis Bay in Duluth. It has no grocery store, and it has been designated a food desert by the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Um, Residents in Lincoln Park have an estimated life expectancy that is 11.2 years shorter than residents in East Duluth. What I'd like to do is share with you the ways in which our community has improved food access in Lincoln Park, what barriers we still face, and how funding from the Good Food Access Program would help us to achieve lasting food security in our neighborhood. Uh, so Fair Food Access arose as a partnership between Lincoln Park residents, LISC, and several Duluth area agencies as a response to the lack of food security in the neighborhood. In the summer of 2012, we conducted a neighborhood-wide survey that reached 1,366 households in Lincoln Park. Um, almost 350 completed the survey. And of these households, 42% indicated that they faced barriers to food access. Um, neighbors also indicated a strong interest in participating in proposed solutions. So 89% said they would patronize a farmer's market. 40% were interested in participating in a community garden. 43% would be interested in using a grocery shuttle or alternate transportation options. The neighborhood identified five main barriers to food access. Um, and they were the absence of a food re retailer in the neighborhood insufficient public transportation to grocery stores in other neighborhoods, the absence of a farmer's market, the need for education about how to grow and prepare our own food, and a lack of available spaces in which to grow food. So in the four years since that survey, the community has implemented solutions to remove most of these barriers. So residents now garden in the Emerald Community Garden, and a deep winter greenhouse is being constructed this June by Community Action Duluth. Uh, residents take classes on gardening at Emerald and cooking classes at the community center. Lincoln Park Farmer's Market opened in 2013. It gets bigger every year. And in addition to being a place for residents to buy and sell local produce um, and more, the market also offers a $15 weekly match to shoppers who use SNAP benefits. Uh, and the Duluth Grocery Express which is a Duluth Transit Authority bus route begun in 2015 and taking Lincoln Park residents directly to and from grocery stores in other Duluth neighborhoods began this week to expand its schedule. And it now runs Monday through Friday during the day. 
In addition, the DTA now includes spaces for grocery bags on all of its buses. So the one food security goal that is still unrealized in our community is a healthy food retailer. And this barrier is still a significant one. Having a healthy food retailer such as a supermarket or a grocery store in Lincoln Park would greatly increase access to healthy food for many of our residents. It would also do more than that. Supermarkets and grocery stores serve as economic anchors in our communities. They supply jobs, they create foot traffic, um, which creates uh, social capital. They also attract other complementary businesses like pharmacies and banks. They're also vital components to a complete community. However, neither a supermarket nor a grocery store has ever been attempted in Lincoln Park. The physical infrastructure doesn't exist. There's no Lincoln Park specific business model for a grocer to follow. And attempts, attempting a business that hasn't been seen before in a neighborhood could be daunting for some, someone scouting locations for their next store. But it would greatly benefit Lincoln Park and meet a significant unmet need. This is exactly the kind of program that the Good Food Access Program or project that that program could make possible by providing some of the funding for the project and thus mitigating some of the risk. And based on the strong community interest we've found thus far, we're confident such an investment would prove successful in the long term. And Duluth's Lincoln Park, a low-income urban community well outside the metro, is just one type of community that the Good Food Access Program could benefit. Thank you for your time today, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Sharman. Is there anyone else who would wish to testify for or against this bill? Are there questions from the members? Seeing no questions, Mr. Chair, it looks like you did a good job with this. Would you have, like to add any final comments? Well, I'd simply like to renew my motion to have House File 1370 be held over for possible inclusion. House File 1370 is laid over for possible inclusion in the Omnibus Agricultural Finance Bill. Thank you. Uh, members, our next meeting will be Tuesday, March 14th. And this meeting is adjourned.